Good day, listeners, viewers. Welcome to this time together. Welcome to the session where we're just going to talk a bit about Jesus Christ. We're just going to share again how good He is, about His faithfulness, about His love, and how much He loves us and what He's given us and His promises. Especially in this time and season that we're moving in, it's a season with so many challenges out there. We need to step into the season with such an expectation, such an excitement to see how is the Lord going to do this. That we really need to come back to that place where we are absolutely in awe and amazement how wise He is. How powerful it is. How great His wisdom is. How great His love is. And in the Bible and New Testament, if we read through the Gospels and things, He said every time that Jesus taught, even as a small boy in the temple, said, where did He come from? Who taught Him? Where did He get all this wisdom, this understanding? And the people were absolutely in awe and amazement. And I believe we're in that season now. And when I sat with the Lord, I said, Lord, what? Do we need to focus? What do we need to step into now in your word that is so important? He took me to the basic psalm that I think everybody knows. I think it's probably one of the first psalms that you hear about when you got saved, when you got reborn. I know when I was a little boy in the church, we went to a very traditional church. And the first thing they taught you at Sunday school and you had to recitate it day by day. And that was the only thing you did was psalm 23 and then i said lord everybody knows this. i said yes but most people recitate it most people declare it out of a spirit of religion we became so used to the words that we totally forgot about the depth and the width and the height of what God is releasing, all the revelation of Psalm 23 and how powerful it is and what God is releasing upon us now in this time and season. But let's pray together. Father, we just come in total surrenderance to you and we just come and we lay ourselves, body, soul and spirit, the fullness of our being in front of you and we open it up for your wisdom, your understanding, your knowledge, Father for your impartation, your activation. And Father, let your spirit of truth just come into us again and give us the fullness of the revelation of Psalm 23, that when we decree and declare it, when we read it, we will do it with so much faith, so much power, so much authority, that all of creation will be impacted and changed, and that the joy of the Lord will fill this earth because of what we have spoken as kings and sons of God. And we thank you so much, Lord, by just sitting here in your presence, but just listening right now. You're already moving us from glory to glory, and already we're not the same anymore. And we thank you in the name of all names, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Amen.
Let's read Psalm 23, and I'm part, um, we're going to do it together out of the Amplified and the Passion Translation. The Amplified verse 1 says, The Lord is my shepherd to feed, to guide, and to shield me. I shall not lack. In the Passion Translation said, The Lord is my best friend and my shepherd. I have always more than enough. Now, people, when we look at the Lord as a shepherd, we need to look at our own lives and think, have I appointed him? Have I given him full permission over my life as a shepherd? Remember what he says in John 10, my sheep hear my voice. They follow me. And a shepherd is one that protects, that leads, that guides the people, that feeds the people. And we need to ask ourselves and our own lives, are we allowing God to guide us. It means, are we walking in His ways and His plans? Are we allowing Him to dictate our life? And that we can only do if we're in a place of full surrender, if we lay down our own plans and our own ways to follow the shepherd. And we know a shepherd boy like David, what he did, because he was faithful being a shepherd, the Lord took him and he overcame the giant Goliath. So when we become faithful shepherds, the Lord is going to take you in the greater things where you're going to slay the giants, where you're going to walk in a greater portion and position of authority like David became king because he took up his role as a shepherd in absolute excellence. And in Ezekiel 34, the Lord warns us about the shepherds. He said, my shepherds are not walking and looking after my people, after my sheep, and that he would come and he will find them and he will lead and protect them. And people, we need to know, if we don't allow Jesus to shepherd us, we can't shepherd other people. Remember now in John 5 and John 12. In John 5 when Jesus says, I do everything what I see my Father in heaven doing. I can do nothing on my own accord. In John 12, I only do what I hear my Father in heaven doing. So that is what we do when we become sheep of the shepherd. We only follow him. We come and we listen to what he tells him and we actually become imitators of God. Exactly what Ephesians 5 verse 1 said, imitate me so that you will imitate the Father. And we must know now when we start allowing God to be a shepherd, he makes a promise to you now and he says, you shall not lack. That is a great declaration that's been made over us. That God's word is yea and amen. And all these times, it doesn't matter where you are, you will not lack. So what does it say? I will always be provided for. And it's not just food or money or protection of everything. It's everything of the being of God. Everything of the being of God has been released upon you and I. We've got access to everything because Jesus, the shepherd, is the door. And through him, you've got access into eternity, into the eternal blessings and everything and provision of everything in creation. And what a promise that is. So we've got no reason to lose our joy. Because God made you a promise and now it's for us to step into that position of faith and say, Lord, I declare Psalm 23 verse 1, I will not lack, you will always provide. And we can give, I can give you many testimonies in my life where since we walked in faith that God always provided. There is no time, no season where I could ever say that God was not faithful to His Word. He always provided. We never lacked. Verse 2, he says, He makes me lie down in fresh, tender, green pastures. He leads me beside the still and restful waters. And the Passion says, He offers a resting place for me in His luxurious love. He, he tracks take me to an oasis, peace, the quiet brook of bliss. What happens now when you and I got saved and reborn, we got united in Christ. And one of the greatest attributes of Christ, obviously, obviously love is the greatest, but then it's peace and rest. And that is in the core being 
of Jesus Christ. So what God says, you are in me, you in the position of peace and rest. And that's why in this position, it is so important when you've got peace and rest, you have got joy. It means that you actually become an untouchable one. You can't be stirred. You can't be moved by anything of darkness because you are seated in the fullness of glory. And in this season, to be in that position of peace and rest, at the brook of peace and rest, and the brook is a stream of water that's, that feeds you, where you drink from. That's why in John 4, where Jesus said to a Samaritan woman, if you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. If you eat of me, you'll never thirst again. And that is what happens when we in total peace and rest and intimacy with God, He feeds us and we drink from Him. Waters of peace and rest. And that's why Psalm 4610 is so important. It says, be still and know I'm God. It actually tells us, go into your position on the brook of still waters and this resting place and peace and rest. So what happens now? When we're going to look in the natural ways, we're going to get stirred. We're going to start making our own plans and we're not going to have hope. We're not going to have joy. We're just going to be, keep on focusing on the darkness and the problems that lies ahead. And we're going to prohibit God to manifest as God of the impossible. That's why Colossians 3 verse 1 to 4 is so important for that seat of peace and rest. It says, keep your eyes on things above in heaven, where your father is seated, where all your blessings are. Infinite. And that is where our seat of peace and rest is from Jesus. Verse 3 goes to, He refreshes and restores my life. He leads me in the path of righteousness, uprightness and right standing with Him, not for my earnings, but for His name's sake. That's where He restores and revives my life. He opens before me pathways to God's pleasure and leads me along in His footsteps of righteousness so that I can bring honor to His name. He restores my life. He brings you back into a place of perfection. When you got saved and reborn, born from above, you were reunited in perfection in Him. So every part of your being that might have been distorted and everything out of your past through hurt and pain and trauma, and unbelief, and so many more things, dark things, he brought it and took it out of darkness and brought it into life. And when he says he restored it, it means he brought you into the fullness of unity with him. That every part of your being is fully engraved, imprinted in him because you need to glorify Him. Everything is about God. When God created, when He created man, He said He created man for Him. To glorify Him, the Word says. To exalt Him. And when He restored you in that position where you can exalt Him because you stepped into the fullness of the image of Yeshua. How He created you from the beginning before you were in the mother's womb. And he says he refreshes you. Refreshes you means he energizes. It means that his dunamis power, that explosive power of him comes into you in all aspects of your life. It's not just an energy. It means there's an explosive power and wisdom and revelation and love and understanding. Whatever you need of the character and the nature of Jesus, that gets refreshed. It means it gets cleansed. All darkness is removed. It's sanctified, it's purified, it takes it into a position of the fullness of godliness. Verse 4, yes, though I walk through the deep sunless valley of the shadow of death, I will fear or dread no evil, for you are with me, and your rod protect and your staff to guide the come and comfort me. What does the Lord say? Even when I'm in darkness, troubled times, I have nothing to fear. The question is, do you believe it? The way we react in troubled times and dark times is a true revelation of your trust and your faith in God. If we look at instances, David with Goliath, he did not fear 
He knew he's walking with God. Joseph, when he was in the pit, when he was in Pharaoh's house, and Potiphar's house, when he was in jail, he did not fear. Paul, when he was in jail, Peter, when he was in jail, they did not fear. Gideon, when there were only 300 to face the thousands, they did not fear because they stepped into a place of faith. Why? They did not fix their eyes on the enemy. They did not fix their eyes on the darkness. They kept on trusting and believing in their God, the revelation, the testimony that they heard and they saw about Him. I will fear or dread no evil. Why can we say it? Fear and dread no evil. When you inside of Christ, darkness can not enter that. You are fully covered in the armor of light and the protection of it. You actually become a glorified and exalted one because you become, you are restored, as I said in the previous word, as one with Him. You are one that is glorified. You are in the image of God. So you walk in the fullness of His glory. For you are with me. And people, how many times I hear people asking me about this last season or this last week or this last month. It's been so quiet. I don't see clearly. I don't hear God's voice. Why have God deserted me? God never deserts you. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You are inside of Him. That's it. Do you believe that you're inside of Christ? And where we make the mistake, we sometimes always wait on a touch or a voice, or an action from God to believe that He's with us. Sometimes I'll say, oh, I get goosebumps, or I can just feel this here, whatever feeling comes into your life. Then we know God is here. But sometimes when He is quiet, we need to just step into the faith. He is with me. And what I've realized in those times and seasons that it feels like He deserted you, that it's quiet. That is the time that He prepares you for your upgrade. That's a time when He comes and imparts new things in you that will blow you away for your next season. It's a preparation season. It's like you're getting rewired again. And then He says, your rod and your staff they comfort me. When God says, everything I've got, you've got. When Jesus says in John 17, and when he says in Colossians 2, that the fullness of him, it means everything that he has is in you. You also have a staff and a rod. Why? Because you and I have been called to be shepherds as well. All of us have got a following. It doesn't matter what job you are in or what school or where college you are or university. You are a shepherd. You've got a following. Even if it's just your kids or your family, they look at you. And what does a staff do? It keeps everything together. It brings it back into oneness. A staff has got a hook at the end. So when a sheep goes astray, you come and you pull them back into unity with the flock. What do we need to do? We need to take our staffs and we need to pull everybody back into the body of Christ, into the bride of Christ to be in the new Jerusalem. And that's why we need to have a heart for the lost. And that's what we need to do with all the lost people out there. We need to take out our staffs and start pulling them back. And one of the best ways to pull them back is to start testifying about the goodness of God, is to have a lifestyle of testimonies that comes out of your faithfulness and your obedience to the instructions of God. And he said he's got a rod. What is a rod? A rod has to do with authority and power. And when you walk as a king that you have been appointed, it means when people see you with a rod, it means everything comes into order. You don't even have to speak. And that's how you get recognized in the spirit in a lot of ways. Have you got your rod with you? Because you are a king. And when you stretch out your rod, it means that everything has to obey and come in alignment with heaven. 
Remember, you, you were created and you and I and were sent to earth to bring heaven to earth. As it is in heaven, so it will be on earth. And that is what the keys. When you walk with a rod, it means you walk in such power and authority and your calling, your purpose, your destiny as a king and a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And you stretch out your rod and everything has to obey because you the ruler appointed by the great I am. We must, we must start reading and acknowledging everything that's declared about Jesus. That is actually who you are, what's in you, what's been given to you. It's not just for Jesus. Because you need to imitate it. You need to become it. You are that. It's been given to you. The question is, have we taken up those positions? Have we activated it? Have we stepped into faith and in what God declares here to us? Verse 5 says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My brimming cup runs over. Passion says, you became my delicious feast. Even when my enemies dare to fight, you anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit and give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. What is it when God prepares a table in front of my enemy? Let me explain to you. Many years ago, I'd encounter in heaven. And as I entered in the palace, I was taken into a room. And there was a long table, probably about five meters long. And it was covered in the most delicious foods and fruits and cakes and delicacies and things. And I, there was only one chair. And Jesus came to me, led me and said, this is for you. Feast on it. And I started eating and he stood in front of me at the other side of the table. And I could just see every bite that I took, everything that I feast on. He just blessed it. He, he got so excited that he could bless me, that he could feed me in such glory and such extravagance. And he couldn't stop laughing. And I just thought, this is amazing. Jesus, the anointed one, the great I am, is giving me all this. How am I going to finish all this? The abundance of his blessing is upon me. And I sat and I remember the apples were huge and glowing. And when you stick it into your mouth, it's like it becomes a gel and it just goes into your body and the meats and the every oh, art was absolutely amazing and the next moment he smiled at me and said look behind you Etienne and when I looked behind me I immediately shrank and I started I wanted to get fear in me because behind me were thousands of demons standing and he said look in front to me again I said yes Lord and he said this is Psalm 23 when I prepare a table in front of your enemies, you will feast of what is in front of you, and that is me. You gaze upon me, you feast on me. Your back will be towards your enemies, and they can't touch you because they know I am looking at them. And as Revelation 1 says, the fire comes out of my eyes, and they know that you are clothed by light by the glory of God. And you're untouchable because you are with me. And people, how many times we miss out on feasting with God. Because we look at the darkness. And in this time and season, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to feast on Him. Eat and drink of Him. Because what you behold with your eyes, what you touch, you become. But if we're going to keep on gazing and engaging the darkness all the time. We're going to get distorted and dark ourselves. We're going to lose our joy, our power. We're going to lose our faith, our hope. We're going to get depression. All those type of things are going to come over our lives. Anxiety, fear, which should not be in the sons of God. In Hebrew 11 verse 5, where God speaks about Enoch, he said it walked and through faith Enoch was translated. And people could not see him. They could not find him. And it says, darkness and death could not touch him. Amazing verse. Why? And I had an encounter last year in September. And had many encounters in the palace of heaven. Where I met Enoch. And what was amazing about Enoch taught me on that verse. He said, he stepped into faith. He stepped into the radical obedience with God. And all he could do was gaze upon Jesus all the time. Never took his eyes off Jesus. He was in such awe and amazement of God. 
That darkness could not see him, touch him, because he was in the fullness of glory. And he got translated. It means he became one with God. He became glory himself. And this is what we need to do in these times where God has created a table in front of our enemies. We need to be in awe and amazement of Him. We need to be transfigured. We need to cleave to God of His glory and become it. That darkness cannot touch us. That darkness will flee. And that is such a powerful verse that we need to get the understanding. You and I have been created to feast on God. Why? When other people see us feasting on God, seeing us as a living testimony of His Word and His goodness, they're going to desire a lifestyle and a God like yours. And that's one of the best ways to become a living testimony, to bring in the lost souls. If we read in verse 5, it said, You anoint my head with oil, my bringing cup runs over. And I love it what it says in the Passion Translation. You anoint me with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. What does God say? I come and I close you with the Holy Spirit. I come and I release the fullness of my Holy Spirit, which is also the fullness of the Father Yahweh and of Yeshua. And I give it all to you. I close you in that glory, in that fullness. That the abundance of you, that you can hardly contain me. And it's unlimited. It's an eternal blessing, provision that you've been given right there. And if we look at the Holy Spirit, it's a spirit that has been given to us, a dimension of Christ. And it is an energy system. It's an activation system. It's an activation of the fullness of Yahweh. And that is what a structure that you and I are walking in and under. That's your covering. That's why having a relationship with the Holy Spirit is so important. It says, you anoint with the fragrance of your Holy Spirit. You can give me all I can drink of you until my heart overflows. Your heart overflows means the abundance of joy came into you. And your fragrance you are releasing. People, that is so important. That's the activation of all your spiritual senses. And you and I become the fragrance of God then. When we walk past the lost, when we walk past other people, their spirit and their souls will recognize the fragrance of God. It will remind them of that relationship of where they were before they were in the mother's womb, when that relationship with the great I am. And that's how you and I can do, and joy, and praises, and thanksgiving, and worship starts releasing that fragrance of God all the time. And that you can only have when you walk in the ways and the statues of Yahweh. We are obedient and obedient to His commandments and everything. I love it. And the book of John, you read a lot about if you love me, you'll obey my commandment. And even if you look at David, he was a man according to God's heart. And how many times, especially in Psalm 119, he declares he meditates on the commandments of God, on the goodness of God. And the commandments are a lot of things. That's every instruction of God. That's every pathway of God. Every way you walk, every plan of God is a commandment and instruction of Him. And when we obey that, when we it's about His goodness, you will be blessed. In verse 6 it said, Surely, or only goodness, mercy, and unfailing love shall follow me all the days of my life. And through all the length of my days, the house of the Lord and His presence shall be my dwelling place. Passion says, So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. It is so important. We must remember everything in the Word arcs over each other. It's like God arcs over you, over all of creation. It's like the cherubims arcing over the covenant of God. 
the Ark of the Covenant. It's like if you don't understand Genesis, you're not going to understand Revelation because everything is about arcing over each other. And then you realize, surely goodness and mercy is going to walk with me. Goodness and love. It is a declaration, my dear. And the key there is going back to verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. He'll guide me and he'll protect me. So first, you need to install him as your shepherd. Then, the ark over it is, then goodness and mercy and unfailing love shall follow me in the days of my life. And through the length of my days, the house of the Lord and his presence shall be my dwelling place. So first, reinstate him as your shepherd. Because he leads you, Jesus the door, he leads you to the Father, into the Father's house. That's why it's so important now to restore him as your shepherd, that you can dwell in the Father's house. People, I want to make this clear. Listen what the word says. It's not one day when I'm going to die, I'm going to go to the Father. It's now. You've been created. After the cross, heavens were opened. That you got access to the Father's house right now now and this is a time now that we need to have the shepherd with us that he leads us in that he guides us in because once you're in the father's house you don't want to leave that place it is so amazing you'll be in awe and amazement the whole time you can't stop gazing and seeking his face all the time and that is what we need to do it because it's a promise goodness mercy love will follow me it will walk with me Let's touch that um, religious spirit a little bit and stir it. Seeing in the spirit, you'll see that goodness, mercy, love, faithfulness, kindness, joy, peace are all heavenly beings as well. So they walk with you and they keep you focused on the great I am. What amazing time, Psalm 23, for this season. It is much deeper. We can probably sit on each verse at least a week and discuss it. There's so much revelation in Psalm 23. But this time when you read it, when you engage it, don't do it religiously. Don't declare it religiously. See the power, the depth, the width and the height in it. And God will be exalted through your life. And you will become a living testimony of Psalm 23. Let's pray. Father, I declare Psalm 23 over each and every viewer. And I say thank you that your spirit will breathe over each and every one now watching and listening to activate the revelation in Psalm 23 in them so that each and every one will dwell in the Father's house. Your word says in Zechariah, if you obey my commandments, I will bless you and you will come and rule in my courts and my house. So Father, I declare that each and every one will obey and become Psalm 23. So it's from now on that it will come and rule and dwell in your house and your courts. I bless them all, Father, with the perfect gift, power of your love. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen and Amen. Bless you all.